Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. It's always unnerving, you know, when you check a group of hunters and the hunter that's hiding evidence is a 13-year-old. And here you have one of the largest springs in the state issuing from the ground. It really is amazing. Oh, I can see the yellow crown. What's more fun than getting outside, being with a bunch of friends, and doing something that brings everyone together? Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Let's go, buddy. Come on. I'm Christy Bales, and this is my canine partner, Ruger. Come on, gotta go. I've been a game warden for approximately 11 years, and I'm stationed in the Travis County area. He is a certified peace officer. You know, he's been commissioned. His badge number is K95. All of our dogs are very high drivers. They need a job. The job that we give them is to use their nose. You know, it's just a win-win for everybody. I really enjoy K9 because, you know, you, you uh, create a bond with your dog. You do a lot of training. And, and then when you get that call, you know, to go help another officer, you know, it's, it's extremely rewarding. I served four years in the Air Force doing law enforcement, and I was exposed to canine at that point. So that's really where my interest in canine began. Our program started in 2013, and we did all of our training in Utah Post, which is equivalent to Texas DPS. Good boy. We have traveled there for narcotics, police search and rescue, instructor school. That's where we have received most of our training. Good boy. Good boy. Come on. Some of the calls that we have been on include illegal game searches, search and rescue of a missing person, including criminal tracks. We have also have been on a lot of article recovery for evidence. The dogs can quickly locate items and cut down on search time. We assist a lot with water safety patrol. Um, when we're out there trying to find boaters that are uh, boating while intoxicated, they could also be impaired on controlled substances, and our dogs can help find those. How you doing? Good. We're going to come aboard here in a second. That's good, Hans. Yeah. Name is Sam Schoenfeld, and I'm a Texas game warden. What's the break? Blitz, uh, who, who's my partner, he's with me every day. He's the one partner that will always keep you going. He's never tired. He's always ready to go. He's something that you need. And, and we need him up here or across the state, finding uh, deer or, sh or shell casings or rifles or pistols. What's up? He's trained when he finds it, he lays down. If it's uh, something on a wildlife basis, a deer or a blood drop or a shell casing, and all he knows is a reward pops up. Hey! Good and, and, and he's ready to find something again. So growing up as a uh, kid in East Texas, I can say we, I grew up in probably the best region of the state, the Piney Woods. Ready? Oh, man. When you're at the house, he gets just to be a part of the family. He gets to run around and play with other dogs, plays with my son, Cooper. And, but then it comes to a point when you watch him out there, he's done. He's where his dad is. It's time to go back to work, Dad. He still knows that he has a job to do, and his job is to go to work with me and, and find something. There we go. So we had a, a group of hunters come in. Oh, what we want Blitz to do is to uh, work the boat, go to the largest source of odor. Let's go. So one thing you're gonna notice is, let's go, come on, let's go. The amount of odor that's gonna be all over the boat. Come on. Uh, shotgun residue, come on. ducks that have been there in the past and, and ducks that may be in there now. So uh, we just used Blitz to see if they left anything behind. There we go. And sure enough, they left a, uh, left a duck in there. Good hunts, Blitz. So uh, they were able to keep the bird, and uh, it keeps them from getting a citation for waste of game. All in all, no violations, but it was a good find for the dog. Today we're doing an organized group training. 
We rarely get to meet like this because we're all spread out across the state. Game one canine search and rescue, sending my dog, make some noise. That's good. We couldn't do this type of work without the funding and generous donations from the public who donated to Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation. Good job, buddy. Kermit, watch. Watch. I started in 1976, and I've done everything from Kermit. confirmation to obedience to hunt tests to therapy dogs. Good girl, Kermit. And I always loved how the dogs can work with people and they love to have jobs. And so part of the canine unit is those wonderful dogs that you know help support the canine officers and do their job. Come on, good girl. When they first started them up, they were looking for funds to help the canine units get started. Good girl. I thought it would be a perfect opportunity to honor good. Robin's involvement with dogs good. over the last 30 years and, and sponsor on. one of the canine units uh, for her. Good. So I would encourage everybody to uh, help support these canine units with the equipment and the dogs and the training that they need to, to perform their mission. It's amazing how many missions they perform in service to the general public. What you got, Woodrow? You got the man? Oh, oh, you got the man? Oh, good boy. Good boy. So I got a call this morning from Sonny, the game warden out of Bastrop County. and. He entered a property to check a group of dove hunters. You know, I continued to be en route because Sonny felt that maybe there was a, there was a chance that they hid a, a shotgun or something. So, um, you know, I was going to assist with Ruger to do an article search. How's it going, Sonny? We got a 13-year-old. He just came out right now. He's claiming he wasn't hunting. OK. I'm going to finish writing to take it and uh, see what they say. Are they related in any way? Brothers or? They're friends. OK. How y'all doing? State game warden, Christy Vales. How's it going? You mind uh, stepping out with this officer real quick? How are you, young man? I'm good. So you doing any hunting today? Uh, no, ma'am. Not at all? No. Do you have a hunting license? No, I do not. OK. Most of y'all don't have a hunting license. So I'm going to get my canine partner out Ruger just to clear the area and make sure that uh, we don't find any uh, shotguns or, or anything like that, okay? Yeah. All right. So no hunting at all? But I have been doing a little bit of hunting. Okay. Uh, is your shotgun here so we can check it to make sure you got a plug in it? I don't know where it is. You don't know where it's at? Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate you being honest about, about hunting, okay? Um, what we're going to do is if you can just go back there and just stay with the... Uh, Officer Alanis, uh, and then uh, I'm gonna get my canine out, okay? Come on. Oh, oh, you ready to go to work? Huh? You ready to go to work? That's a good boy. Let's go. Ready? Revere. Anytime we go on a real deployment, it's a brand new area. Um, new smells, uh, he can feel our adrenaline and excitement. Um, you know, it's a lot different than a training scenario. So he did very well. Oh, good boy. That's a good boy. Good job, buddy. Oh, oh, oh. oh, that's a good revere, buddy. As a canine handler, I will not touch the evidence because I don't want my fingerprints on it. I'll go back and contact Warden Alanis, but because there's only two of us, officer, officer safety, I'll just go switch, watch the guys, uh, put Ruger up, and he can come back and take photos and get the shotgun. So I'm going to go ahead and give you a verbal warning. No ticket this time, but if it happens again, you will get a ticket. You understand? Yes, sir. All right. I'll go ahead and step back over there. 
It's very unfortunate that the individual that is hiding evidence is the minor, the 13-year-old. If the adults that he was with had Hunter's education, this probably would have been avoided and the young child would have been educated on the ethics of hunting. You know, several of the adults didn't have a hunting license um, and it's just not a good example for, you know, that young 13-year-old. It's our scheduled day off. I like to take Ruger to the park and just let him run and be a dog and enjoy himself so he doesn't have any stress. Good boy. Today, we're just out here throwing the ball and, you know, just letting him swim and have a good time. All of us Game Warren Canine units, we love what we do and we're very dedicated to serving the public. These canines are amazing animals and we are extremely proud to have them as our canine partners. Yeah, that's a good boy. Good job, buddy. The biggest thing that, that strikes me about San Solomon Springs is, is just the sheer volume of water that you have in the middle of a, of a desert. You're essentially surrounded by mountains in this desert landscape and you're, you're hundreds of miles from, from any other major water source. And here you have one of the, the, the five, six largest springs in the state issuing from the ground. It's, it really is amazing. Chad Norris is probably the most passionate person I know when it comes to talking about springs. I joke all the time that he's Texas Parks and Wildlife's uh, one-man groundwater department. We have five endangered species associated with San Solomon Springs and the aquatic systems. There's two fish species, the Comanche Springs pupfish, as well as the Pecos Cambusia. And then there are two snail species and one amphipod, which is a tiny shrimp-like crustacean. These species are endemic to that region. Um, they're generally recognized as being what we would call relic species. They, they have evolved and adapted to these spring habitats and through the millennia of time, they've just been restricted further and further um, and isolated in those spring-fed habitats. And these smaller things here are the snails. See how tiny they are? Not the most picturesque endangered species. In the fall of 2016, there was, it was announced there was a um, large oil discovery in, the, in that part of the Permian Basin. Along with that came concerns that there might be potential impacts to springs in the Balmeray area. There's going to be an increased demand for water, um, so there's some concern that, that the water quantity that issues from San Solomon Springs um, could be decreased, as well as potential impacts to water quality. The biomonitoring program at San Solomon Springs has provided us with an opportunity to work with um, other entities in an interdisciplinary approach. We're working with hydrogeologists from the um, University of Texas. We're working with Texas State University and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Nature Conservancy. To our knowledge, this is the first time that we've had all of these different disciplines, everybody working together to collect data on a, a routine monitoring basis. Data is the new bacon. Everybody loves bacon and scientists love data. I actually have a shirt that says that. <laughs>
Wish you could spend more time with nature? Well, every month you can have the great outdoors delivered to you. Since 1942, Texas Parks and Wildlife Magazine has been the outdoor magazine of Texas. Every issue is packed with outstanding photography and writing about the wild things and wild places of this great state. And now Texas's best outdoor magazine is available as an app. It's just that easy. Texas Parks and Wildlife Magazine, your connection to the great outdoors. It's just before sunrise at Benson Rio Grande Valley State Park. And some creatures are stirring. Everybody ready? A group has gathered for one purpose. Oh, I have the checklist. To see and hear as many kinds of birds as they can in a day. I think the goal for today is 100. They are competing in the great Whistling Texas down. birding classic. Team name? The Queenfishers. These are the Queenfishers. I'm the king of the Queenfishers. <laughs> Before they enter the park, you hear it? they have already made some progress. Got it. Screech out. Woo! <gasps> We're not going to move from the parking lot. We're going to stay here. We're going to stay here the whole day. <laughs> you have lunch, binoculars, field guide. You need to use the restroom before you go. A few hours to the north, another team gathers. Team Osprey, let's go. Team Osprey. It's the awesome Ospreys with two birding mentors and their science teacher. Ready? Let's go. <laughs> this team of fifth graders is also embarking on the birding classic. Okay, there was a bird we saw a lot on Saturday. Do you remember what bird that is? It's something barrelope. You are correct. It is a phalarope. Good job, Brian. Martha so McLeod uses the competition the to teach students about biology shoveler. and shoveler, also yeah. teamwork. Oh, did you see it? Uh-uh. All right, whole team's got to see it. That's a big skill we work on with these kids. We teach them to collaborate together, valuing each other's opinions, listening to what someone else has to say. You guys keep your eyes to the sky. This is the culmination of a year's worth of study with these kids. Call it out loud when you see a bird. Like the queen fishers, There's a great blue the awesome right ospreys hope to see a hundred bird species by noon. Yay, great blues on the list. And they too are off to a good start. 88 more to go. <laughs> Kids need a tangible target to shoot for, and so setting 100, that's a good number for them to try and work for for a species count. Back in the Rio Grande Valley, the counting continues. There's the woodpecker again. That's a uh, black crested titmouse. Yeah. And that's a cardinal. It's getting good. <laughs> right back in the street. Green jay. Nice. I got the green jay, I got the titmouse. Morning jay. Oh, that's another one. That's a lot of Oh, there he is. There he is. Yeah, that's a beautiful bird. It's a green heron. It's pretty incredible birding down here, which is why this competition is so much fun. More than half of all the birds that have been seen in the U.S. have been seen in our four county area. Oh, what's that? One of the Great Texas Birding Classic teams had almost 200 in one day. Great Texas Mosquito Classic. Oh, I get a little mosquito. What's more fun than getting outside? being with a bunch of friends and, and doing something that really just brings everyone together. <laughs> While the Great Texas Birding Classic was once held only along the coast, it is now statewide. They're good, they're good. Teams choose when to compete from mid-April to mid-May and how. Serious birders may opt for a 24-hour big day in their region or even a full week statewide, visiting as many sites as possible. The Sunrise to Noon tournament may be more ideal for youth teams or those more focused on just having fun. But perhaps the most relaxing way to participate in the birding classic is known as the Big Sit. We have some shorebirds right over there. Like, see where that blind is? Yeah. The Big Sit is a really great event in the birding classic. It is literally birding from a 17-foot diameter circle for a full 24-hour day, or as much of a day as your team wants to do. The Big Sit is just something that literally anyone can do. We call it the tailgate party for birders. I'm an amateur birder. A lot of these people are newbies, and then we have one or two really good birders on the team that are helping explain what everything is. Most of them are cliff swallows. So it's this wonderful learning experience. Semi palmated it's Ann Piper. I got to see that one. We are the tweeting chats. The chatting tweets. The tweet 
tweeting chat. <laughs> they are communications folks, and they tweet, they use social media. A chat is a type of bird. A, a yellow-breasted yellow chat. chat. I'm sure it tweets. <laughs> it's just a very fitting name for this team. This group is great, and they're having a good time. We're an embarrassment to birders everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Back on the coast, the awesome ospreys hit the birding hotspots of Port Aransas. We are at the Leona Turnbull Birding Center. No, oh, here, fix your jacket. There you go. Okay, I'm hoping these kids can get to 100. They're the last team to compete. Where'd it go? Being at the tail end of migration, it's gonna be tough. It just flew over there. Right now, they're neck and neck with my fourth grade team. Yeah, the Eastern Kingbird up there. There's an Oriole. Oh, is he a spoonbill guy? Whoa, what is that? White Ibis. The red and black bird. We're going to go to several places today, so we've got a lot of time ahead of us. Oh, there it is. By mid-morning, the queenfishers and their king are looking for kingfishers. As we were eating our breakfast, a green kingfisher perched about 20 feet away from us and then uh, dashed across the water to the other side of the pond. They're on the t-shirt. We're in the area to get them, so hopefully we'll get all three today. The team has migrated to the Edinburgh Scenic Wetlands, another world birding center site. We've seen a lot. Hopefully we'll see more. In our region here in South Texas, the last 10 years, there's been so much development of these nature centers for the world birding centers. So it's getting easier and easier just to find a place in your backyard neighborhood to go out and bird and see what's out there. And some true neighborhood birding is also on the agenda. One of the things that I like is our trees are kind of short. <laughs> so you can drive through and look through the neighborhoods and there's some great neighborhoods with old growth trees. Oh, it's right there. And you can see some really great birds in there. Oh, I can see the yellow crown. So you can do drive birding as we were doing today and walking around. Very easy to do. Okay, let's go. Bird on. We are not to 100 yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're in the 70s right now. Okay, if not a blue jay, something else we haven't gotten. I hope we don't see it like at 12.01. No! Does everybody see a sandwich turn? Yes. No. Right there. From their mobile bird blind, the awesome ospreys continue their count, taking in habitat from beach to bay and woodland to wetland. Oh, that's the red start. That's the red start. It's got like the yellow on it. As noon and the end of their competition approaches, the heat and early start begin to take their toll. After a while, you kind of start getting tired. Eventually, even the birds need some rest. It's their noon freak out. It's 12, guys. That's it. Woo! Bird like crazy all morning and then go eat lunch. It's nice. <laughs> Great blue heron. Yes. Great egret. Yes. yes. In the final tally, the queenfishers did not reach a hundred species, but they did finish second in the all ages sunrise to noon competition. Eighty-six species. We didn't get to a hundred, but eighty-six is still pretty good for half a day. See anything cool, Brian? The awesome ospreys placed third in their region and age group, seeing one hundred and five species of birds. And the tweeting chats saw 54. So it's coming in here. Ranking guys. them first among their region's big sits. But the numbers may really be for the birds. In its first year as a statewide contest, the great Texas Birding Classic raised $17,000 for habitat conservation and nature tourism projects. It's for a good cause and we had fun. I really enjoy it. I enjoy bird watching. I enjoy keeping track of the birds that we see. And it's definitely more fun for us when we do it together. What was that? <laughs> so it's a um, tanager. Yes, it is. Truly amazing in a year's time how much they've learned. Yeah. Not just going out and look at birds, oh, they're cute, they're pretty, let's count them. Yeah. They learn that they've got a responsibility as stewards of the environment. Oh, yeah. They inspire me daily. Yeah, cool. yeah, look. They're interested, they're curious. They just need that adult to take them out in the outdoors. You guys ready? Those are good birds. Keep looking. <laughs> <laughs>